busy intersection on Route 6A in Wareham is not a likely start on a road to tranquility. Turn here onto Red Brook Road and you pass one after another summer colony of houses. They face on shallow Buttermilk Bay at the southern end of the Cape Cod Canal. Hardly a mile beyond this corner, though, the view widens out. Houses replaced by broad salt marsh that marks the mouth of Red Brook and the edge of the Lyman Reserve. The 200-acre reserve owned by the trustees of reservations is really a summary of Cape Cod landscapes. Through it all winds a track in time that reaches back thousands of years. In the beginning, the trail looks like a lot of other woodland trails. Scruffy underbrush, pine trees, oaks, robins hopping along the path. This little piece of path here is probably all we're going to see of what remains of the Indian trail that led long, long ago from Fall River all the way to Cape Cod. Red Brook rises in a spring at the top of the stream. It's fed by more springs for its entire length, which makes for an interesting environment. All down the brook, there are spots of controlled temperature from those springs. Cool in the summer, open in the winter. The stream bed is regularly swept clear of sand and muck. It provides a gravelly bottom much loved by sea-run brook trout, or salters, to those in the know. But this is not just a story about a stream and some sea-run brook trout. It's a story of people. The people who came here, who lived here, who found uses for this land and the stream. The Wampanoag had come here for eons before the white men to take advantage of the fish runs in the spring and the fall. They came on a working vacation, gathering the herring who were rushing upstream in the spring and catching as they could, netting uh, the trout that swam in from the sea in the fall to lay their eggs and keep them safe for the winter months. It was a good place to celebrate the beginning of the warm season or to commemorate the end of it. We've climbed a hill next to the stream and we're emerging now out into a very strange and wonderful habitat, the Pine Barrens, for which Cape Cod especially is particularly known. If you were a game bird or a small critter, you would probably love this environment. On the other hand, if you were a colonial or a 19th century farmer, it would not be so pleasant. You can't grow anything in solid sand. Well, perhaps asparagus, but not much else. There is one thing that's worthwhile here, if you're thinking in terms of economy. This is the land of pitch pine. And pitch pine, as its name suggests, is the source for the pitch and refined the tar that was used in every boat in all of the boat building that made the Cape Cod and South Coast port towns so wealthy. This sandy highland that we're standing on drops off swiftly on the east side, ending in the brook. But what to me is more fascinating is the fact that we're standing on the very edge of a glacial outwash plain. And in under the sand are seeps of water rising from deep down below, flowing downhill where we can't even see them, and ending up in the brook. Because of all the geological upheaval here, there were a few special resources. The acidic soils provided a perfect place for peat to develop in thick layers and embedded frequently in those peat bogs were chunks of bog iron. Those rusty lumps of ore were what gave the brook its name, the Red Brook. And that iron, like the pitch and the tar, was also essential to the region's boat building industry. The iron provided barrel hoops 
it provided nails, it provided the underpinning for a new world economy. When American iron making shifted to Pennsylvania, ore bogs became cranberry bogs. The acid, sandy soil was perfect for these native plants that wanted wet feet, and local farmers cashed in on a crop in demand on every ship that sailed the seas. Along Red Brook, the bogs were small, though, and by the mid-1800s couldn't compete with large commercial operations. Into this struggling landscape in 1867 came Theodore Lyman III. Lyman had just been appointed Commissioner of Inland Fisheries for the state, and he came to the South Coast to look into industrial interference with the annual fish runs. He also came to fish. And over the next decade, he accumulated 300 acres, bracketing Red Brook upstream, abandoned iron ore sites, and cranberry bogs were reimagined as protective banks for the clear, cool waters favored by salters. He bought a small cottage at the mouth of Red Brook. In one of his journal entries, he reports proudly that he had acquired a set of dishes and a couple of pots and pans which were enough. And in this well-worn desk was kept the Red Brook book, book or Red Brook journal. Friends and colleagues and relatives were dragged into a decades-long study of the trout's habits and their numbers. The study subjects may have ended up as dinner, but they were weighed and measured first, and all the information was carefully tallied even the door in this small space was used as a document. Here, some outlines and uh, appropriate plaques of the prize trout caught on Red Brook. And in the narrow hall closet below the stairs are the waders, so essential to trout fishing, and the decoys, so essential to hunting. Heading up the stairs, we get to another part of the Lyman experience. And if you look closely, this map documents the results of the devastating forest fire that swept over a large tract on the south coast. Here, for instance, Theodore Lyman, 73 acres, burned. The standard of comfort in a small fishing shack like this one, shack perhaps, not quite the right word, but close enough, is very different from what we think of as an exclusive preserve today. This is no spa-like resort. It's a small room in a small house with basic furnishings. An old bureau, a coal-fired grate, and the trout that you had just caught today for dinner was enough to put anyone to sleep. This part of the stream doesn't look like the beautiful gravelly bottom that the trout are looking for. And in fact, if you look upstream from there, you'll see more sand, along with logs. Logs that frame the banks, logs that come right across the stream itself, breaking up the flow of the water, logs that zig and zag downriver. There's a reason for that, and it has to do with Theodore Lyman and also, more recently, the Trustees of Reservations and their partners, Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife and Trout Unlimited. These are ways of catching and stopping some of the sand that washes downstream from the large commercial cranberry bogs up near White Island Pond or did until recently. In the last year or so, the bog owners have worked with the partners and in fact sold 
much of the cranberry bog land so that it too has become part of this vast conserved wetland area. Theodore Lyman did what thousands of Boston Brahmins have done before and since. He elevated what was a personal pleasure in the service of a higher good. He and his descendants, and now the trustees of reservations with their partners, have returned Red Brook to an ecologically sound habitat, a beautiful place to retreat for a few minutes or a few hours from the world of business and beyond, and to appreciate what was here before white Americans for a century or so tried to change it. Redbrook is back to an almost natural state, and we're all the better for it.